Welcome to Conscious Cafe Global. My name is Gina Lazenby. I'm your host tonight with Judy Piatkus, and we are having a wonderful presentation tonight, an interactive exploration with Dr. Sharon Blackie. It's going to be talking about the second half of life. And it's interesting how in our culture, over the age of 50, 60, everything in our culture points to a declining uh, less opportunities, an expectation of poor health, everything diminishing. And yet um, we are here to discuss tonight how that could be a different story, um, how we can use uh, this as a transition to something more rich and more vibrant and find out more about uh, expressing our unique gifts in a different way or in a greater way. Um, Sharon Blackie is uh, an award-winning writer, psychologist and mythologist, her highly acclaimed books include The Enchanted Life, If Women Rose Rooted, and her latest book, Haggitude, Reimagining the Second Half of Life. And here, just literally published, I can put it up to the camera here, you can see that. That's uh, Sharon's latest book. And she's going to be talking uh, about the relevance of myth, fairy tales, and folk traditions to solving some of the personal, social and environmental problems that we have. Personally, I absolutely love fairy tales. I love the idea of leveraging the wisdom therein for my later life. Um, Sharon has written extensively uh, in international media, featured in The Guardian, The Irish Times and The Scotsman, and her books are translated into several international languages. So uh, let's give uh, Sharon, a beautiful warm welcome. If the room was open, we would be applauding, but let's give her a wave. And I shall now uh, unspotlight myself, bring the spotlight and spotlight Sharon. Welcome, Thank you. Sharon. Thank you very much for that introduction, Gina and Judy. Thank you for inviting me this evening. I have to say that normally I'm tucked up in bed at 8.30 in the evening, um, being a super, super early riser. So if I look a little bit tired, <laughs> you'll need to forgive me. Hopefully, um, hopefully the conversation will uh, will keep us all going at this time of the evening here in the UK. So yes, myth and story really is my thing, I suppose, all of my books in some way relate to myth and story and have myth and story at their heart. And there is one particular story, which when I first heard it, or one particular storybook character rather, which when I first heard about her, really shook me to the core. And this would have been probably about 20 years now. And she comes from the oldest cosmology of my native lands, which are North of England, Ireland and Scotland. And in that cosmology or in that mythology, if you prefer, it wasn't a sky bound old man with a big white beard who made and shaped this world. It was an old woman, an old woman, a giant old woman, to be precise, who has been with us down all of the long ages since the very beginning of time. And in some of the stories about her, she says, when I was a young lass, the ocean was a forest full of trees. So she remembers the very, very oldest times, the oldest times of the earth. And those stories in, in Scotland and in Ireland particularly are still told today in the oral tradition. That mythology, which is from right here in these places where, where my feet are planted. And you know, a lot of attention over the past couple of decades in particular has been paid to the question of whether throughout Europe there was a great mother goddess who was honoured by many, many peoples. But certainly in this part of the world, we weren't so much honouring a great mother as a great grandmother. And that is something that we have forgotten. It's been erased from our memory to the extent that we remember any of these old stories and this old woman whose name was the Kaliach which literally means old woman in the Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic languages, they have been kind of erased from our mythology. They're just characters in some story that, you know, is, is um, entertainment or uh, stories for children. And part of my passion is to remind people that these are not just stories for entertainment. Once upon a time, these characters and these stories represented our worldview. They were, if you like, our religion, although that's a word that I don't much relate to. But certainly they were 
entirely tied up with our way of looking at the world and explaining how it came to be, how we came to be, and what we are here for. So Haggitude, uh, the book that Gina was talking about, really begins with that character who had such an amazing impact on me and just made me think, well, gosh, you know, we, we look at old women now in our culture and we see them as irrelevant, we see them as invisible, we wish they would go away, they're inconvenient. But back in the day, they were actually the ones who made the world turn. And to me, myths and stories in general help us, I believe, as a psychologist who is trained in um, and specialized in narrative techniques, they help us not only to understand life as it is, but to imagine life as perhaps it ought to be, and to imagine ourselves in ways that are perhaps more functional and deeper. We, we clearly perceive and make sense of the world through stories. I think that has been shown time and time again. And storytelling, of course, is a universal um, human phenomenon. The stories that we tell each other teach us, in a sense, everything we know about how the world is. Their lessons are deep and rich. They can reveal to us longings that we knew we never had. They can fire us up with new ideas and insights, and they can help us to reimagine ourselves, particularly at times of trouble. So the beautiful things about fairy tales, in particular folk tales and mythology as well, is when we are faced with an impossible situation, they always show us a way that we had never imagined that we can find a way out of it. And I think for many of us in this culture, as we approach the threshold of the second half of life, it is particularly challenging because of the way the culture, you know, doesn't really value older women. And so it seems to me that if we can find inspiration in the old stories, if we can find, in a sense, maps for the narrative of the second half of our lives, then that has to be a good thing. Uh, when I was a psychologist practicing narrative therapy, narrative psychology, it was very clear to me that stories capture people's imagination in a way that very few other psychological techniques do. And if you can capture somebody's imagination and you can help them see the possibility of change and transformation, then they're going to give that change and transformation a try. And so stories to me are one of the key ways in which we can inspire ourselves to create a new narrative in this particular case for elderhood for the second half of life. And that's what I was trying to do in Haggitude to showcase some of the old stories throughout Europe, which have older women as their key characters, as, as their protagonists. And in the context of the stories, or set against the context of the stories, is psychology. Um, ever since the very groundbreaking work of Carl Jung at the beginning of the 20th century, most depth psychologists have argued that the journey into elderhood, the journey through the second half of life, is a spiritual passage above all. That during the first half of life, we're predominantly building, growing, becoming, creating a family, a profession, a home, or whatever. But in the second half of life, we move away from those more outward directed pursuits and look more inwards at what we're here for and also uh, at, at the world in general and how it might become and how we might participate in its becoming. So the purpose of the second half of our lives in depth psychology is to grow into the person that we were always meant to be. And as a folklorist and mythologist, as well as a psychologist, it seems to me that story can be our primary inspiration. It's a, a much neglected tool that helps us to conjure up images of who exactly it is that we might want to become. Stories, in that sense, change us. So what is interesting, if if you look at stories about older women in the European context, very few of them have older women as their protagonists, as the main character. 
And I found no stories when I was doing my research for Hagitude, which show us how clearly to transition into a rich and meaningful elderhood, or even which hold up any kind of mirror of clarity to the nature of our life journey at this time. But what they do show us these stories is that there are many, many different kinds of archetypal old women who play absolutely pivotal roles in the stories. These are characters who pull the strings, who weave the webs in which the, the other characters are journeying. Um, they test the heroes and heroines. They advise the heroes and heroines. These old women are the ones who understand what is necessary to put an unbalanced world back in balance or to put an unbalanced hero or heroine back into balance. So they have the bigger picture. So even if they're not the hero of the story, they are absolutely critical to the way in which the story unfolds. And there really is very little attention paid to this. And again, that was something I wanted to highlight. So I believe that if we look at these older women kind of running the show in the background in the stories, it helps us to, it gives us insight into the ways in which each of us individually can embody what we might think of as an elder woman's wisdom. They give us some insight into the nature of an elder woman's wisdom in a culture that doesn't really actually believe that such a thing exists. And really that is kind of the key question for me as I wrote Haggitude and as I'm continuing with my work around elderhood and the inspirations of elderhood in women, how can an exploration of these wonderfully vivid and diverse characters in the old stories help us recreate a map of what it is to become a good elder? How do we make the most of these wonderfully fertile decades which stretch out from menopause and beyond through the second half of life? How do we make the most of them? Um, how do we create a new vision for what it is to be an elder woman in a society which has lost all um, sense of, of what that might be and, and, and a sense of what the value of that might be. So to begin with, we have menopause, I see, as the beginning of the journey into elderhood. And everyone here tonight will have been born into a culture which teaches us that menopause is a disease, a failure, a dysfunction. It's presented to us all the time as a lack, um, specifically a lack of estrogen, the so-called fertility hormone, which we must always compensate for. And I do just want to flag that when I say that, um, I don't mean in any way to suggest that medicating um, to replace estrogen, such as HRT, is a bad thing. I think it absolutely has its place in um, in finding our way through the very, very thorny paths of menopause. What I object to very much in the culture is the way in which even today, when we're beginning, at least in the UK, I'm not sure what it is like in the rest of the world, to have more regular and um, louder conversations about menopause, it is still presented to us as something that we must resist you know, that at all costs, we must hold on to all of the things that are inevitably, because of our aging, going to fade away. And that HRT is not used to help us through some very, very difficult physical symptoms, but it is presented to us as something that we must take to cling on to youth, which of course we cannot ever do. And I do believe very firmly in questioning what is the innate wisdom of our bodies in producing menopause at this time in our lives. Because I don't believe that any major physical changes like this, particularly the kind of shattering changes that we have as men at menopause, just as we have shattering changes at puberty, I don't believe that they're accidental. I believe that they fulfill a purpose and that for the physical passage, there is a parallel psychological passage which we would do well 
to pay attention to. So, you know, menopause in some way clearly is an ending of sorts, and it's natural to mourn an ending. And I think many of us feel grief at the beginning of that passage for everything that is slipping away, but it's also a new beginning. It's a time of transformation. And I'd like to quote to you the very wonderful late author, Ursula K. Le Guin, who um, expressed this idea beautifully. And she said, I've got a quote here somewhere, the woman who is willing to make that change, that's to, and to really embrace the change of menopause, the woman who is willing to make that change must become pregnant with herself at last. She must bear herself, her third self, her old age. And I love that image because to me, menopause is very much a time between stories. It's not just a pause in our menses, it's a pause in our lives. So the old story, if you like, the story of our of the first half of our lives, the building, the growing, the creating, the playing, the kind of outward looking stuff, that is slowly beginning to come to an end. And there's a new story which is ready to begin. And menopause is the place where we incubate that new story. It's the time when, as Le Guin said, we are pregnant with a possibility of a new self. And if only in our culture we were taught to see menopause as this wonderful incubation time, difficult for sure, but nevertheless very rich and filled with possibility, I think we would look at our elder years in a different light. So, you know, we, we I think of menopause as a process which is also alchemical. So, there was a stage in the old um, alchemy, um, back in the medieval times, which was called the negredo, the, the blackening. And this was an early stage of the alchemical process, a long and a very difficult phase, where everything that the substance in question was, is stripped away to an essence. So the blackening is kind of a burning. And the substance which is burning is forced to shed everything that is superfluous, everything that it doesn't need anymore. So we're kind of stripping away the old stories and the old ways of being in the world so that its true nature can be revealed. And that to me is the perfect metaphor for what menopause is. Everything is stripped away. Everything is burned away, literally, sometimes in the hot flushes, in order that we can, we can be stripped back to the essence of who we were meant to be and get some insight into how we might then live for the remaining decades of our lives. Now, I see that as a, a time of great potential. Now, that burning away, as I've said, can be very, very uncomfortable, but it is necessary to reveal um, the essence of us, if you like, the, the, the gift that each of us, the unique gift that each of us brings to the world. So menopause is the beginning of this wonderful journey into elderhood. It's a time, um, it's kind of a liminal time, where we turn inwards to embark upon the inner work of elderhood, that work of reimagining and reshaping who we want to be in the world, how we want finally in our last decades to get our gifts out there. So when we look at revisioning our elderhood, when we look at stepping back in the process of menopause and letting all the old stuff be stripped away and saying, okay, what is it now that I will become? I believe very strongly that stories and the characters in them are there to help us and to inspire us to see ways in which we might fit now into this new way of being. And stories contain the best, the, the, the best fairy stories and the best myths are powerful because they contain characters which are known in um, the world of psychology as archetypal characters. 
And I just want to spend a couple of minutes telling you what an archetype is. I'm sure many of you, particularly those of you who are familiar with my work already, will know this, but some of you may not. And it's just worth understanding what an archetype is. An archetype is a, the archetype is a, a, a word, a term coined by Carl Jung, building on the work of ancient Greek philosophers all the way back to Plato. And an archetype is kind of an idea of a character. It's the essence of a character which cannot be reduced or stripped away any further. Archetypes can also be ideas. They don't have to be people. So let's say an archetypal idea is beauty. Okay, this is a concept, this is an idea that everyone, every human being will understand. Everybody knows what beauty is. Everybody has an idea of beauty. It's an archetype. But the way in which beauty is represented or perceived or understood varies from culture to culture, varies from person to person. What is perceived to be beautiful in Japan might not be what is perceived to be beautiful in America. What I think is beautiful, you might not think is beautiful, but we all have this idea of beauty. We can't be reduced, do you see? So beauty is the archetype, and then there are all kinds of expressions of beauty out in the world. The same with characters. So we can conceive of a character that we might think of as the old woman of the world, and we all know what that is. That's the old woman who just like keeps it all going. Some of the old women that I'm going to talk about. But in America, that old woman of the world in Native American traditions might be thought of as Grandmother Spider. In my traditions in Ireland and Scotland, she might be thought of as the Kaliach, who is a very rocky character who makes and creates and shapes the land. In Slavic tradition, she might be Baba Yaga, who lives in a hut in the middle of the forest on chicken legs and flies through the air in a mortar waving a pestle. So archetypes are these essential characters that we all in some way recognize, but they kind of, if you like, wear different clothing from culture to culture. So what I did in Haggitude and what I want to, to spend a little bit of time talking about now is I looked at the different archetypal characters in European myth and folklore who were old women. And I looked at what qualities they represented, which might give us some inspiration for what we might become when we grow older. So I want to just talk about some of those very briefly. And then in a little while, we will go into breakout rooms for 15 minutes where you can talk about some of the ideas that I'm going to shoot at you um, for the next 20 minutes or so. And then we'll come back and have a discussion. So I'm not going to talk forever. Don't panic. Some of those archetypes in, in menopause, because it's worth, even for those of us who are past menopause, it's worth looking back and thinking, OK, what was I? You know, what archetypal character was I when I was going through my menopause? There is an archetype known in Jungian circles as the medial woman. And I think of the medial woman as the perfect archetype for menopause. Now that word, that term was first came into being in around 1956 when Carl Jung had a student and also his lover, uh, a woman called Tony Wolf. And Tony Wolf did some research and described what she believed to be four key archetypes of womanhood. Not the only archetypes of womanhood, but the ones that she, from her own personal experience, believed were the most important. They were the mother, the hetaira, the Amazon, and the medial woman. Now, the mother is fairly obvious. You know, this is an archetype that everybody would recognize. She appears in all kinds of stories. We all have a mother. If I say to you, mother, Everybody knows what that means, even though our impression of what it is to be a mother and what it is to have had a mother will differ. The mother defines herself by relationship to her children. The second uh, one of those archetypes that Tony Wolfe described, the hetaira, is, um, comes from a Greek word which kind of means, let's just say muse, it's a kind of muse character. So the hetaira defines herself in relationship to somebody who she is inspiring, usually a man, of course, back in the day. The third one, the Amazon, 
is a kind of warrior woman who sets herself up as a kind of feminine masculine. So in a sense, defines herself against some masculine ideal of what it is to be a strong warrior woman. The medial woman is the only one of those four characters who does not define herself in relationship to anybody at all. The medial woman is entirely whole unto herself. So she finds her primary identity and her fulfillment in cultivating her relationship to, to herself, to her own unique way of being in the world, to her own unique gift, to whatever it is that she has to offer the world. It's not that she doesn't have relationships, perhaps, that she cares about, but she doesn't def she's not defined in that context. And it seems to me that that is such a fine archetype for midlife and beyond, because I think that is what is supposed to happen to us as women in midlife. We're very often, not for everybody, clearly, I'm making, I can only ever make generalizations here, where very often we have defined ourselves by relationships. It is kind of, you know, conceived archetypically as a feminine way of being in the world, relationship. But now what we're called to do when we come into midlife and as we pass beyond is to find out who we are by ourselves, our essence, when everything we ever cared about has been stripped away. What is it that we are? And that's the medial woman. The medial woman also um, is on a search for the kind of knowledge which we might think of as mystical. So medial women are kind of seekers and keepers of esoteric knowledge and wisdom, and they value uh, a direct personal kind of mystical experience over that which is passed down in dogma and hierarchy, such as you might find in, in traditional religions. So the medial woman is above all a, a seeker, a seeker for what she might perceive to be the truth of the world and to understand her place in it. And yeah, she is my favorite archetype for midlife. There are various kinds of medial woman. You can break down that archetype a little bit more. And there are three that I think are particularly important in menopause, three types of medial woman. The first is the alchemist. So I talked about menopause as a kind of process of alchemy, a burning, a stripping away. We're in the crucible. We're being burnt right down to the essence. The alchemist is a mistress of transformation. Now, when we think of alchemist, because we've all seen all kinds of um, artwork from medieval times, we tend to think of an old man with a big white beard in a dark uh, laboratory uh, bent over all kinds of arcane contraptions and chemical apparatus and what have you. Actually, some of the first prominent uh, alchemists were women. So that's worth bearing in mind. I'm not going. I don't have time to tell you all about them, but just trust me on that. So the alchemist is a a mistress of transformation. She's not afraid to burn things back to the bone to expose what lies beneath. She's a visionary and also a catalyst for the changes that she is conjuring into being. And in that sense, she's kind of reimagining and so recreating the world. So the alchemist is one of the archetypes of midlife. I particularly relate to the alchemist, I have to say. Uh, that seems to me to have been part of my journey through practicing as a psychologist and writing the kind of work that I do. Another type of medial woman archetype is the witch. So the alchemist shows us one face, the witch is another. What we, uh, the, the witch really, the witch is a long story, <laughs> again, that I don't have much time to go into, but the witch is a, represents a kind of knowing of the world. Uh, it's not about power. To me, the archetype of the witch is not about power over. It's about understanding the nature of the world and being able to kind of commune with the natural world and the other than humans that inhabit it, uh, inhabit it with us in order to create different kinds of change. The witch is a really complex archetype, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm just glossing over it in the interests of time, but that is another one. 
and of course a long complex history where once upon a time she was a very negative character and we've kind of reinvented her to be a kind of I don't know um, a green earthy wise woman that many of us long to be the other uh, medial woman archetype which is of interest is the mystic and in Haggatute I write of the Christian mystic Hildegard of Bingen as a typical kind of mystic and Hildegard even though she was a Christian was a very very earthy woman she talked about God being imminent in the land she talked about this concept called viriditas which means greening which literally meant God the divine um, in in the world in the green grass in the trees in the world all around us which was very very unusual for a Christian at the time so uh, Hildegard's mysticism was a very grounded earthy mysticism so we have all of these different ways of being the medial woman this this uh, midlife woman who is trying to understand what the world is and her place in it as we move beyond menopause we encounter different kinds of archetypes so it appears to me or it seems to me from my research and from my work that it's at, during menopause all of us in one way or another encounter the medial woman we all encounter some face of the medial woman because we go through this profound stripping away this quest for meaning the search for authenticity and that is whether you like the word or not a spiritual search so we all encounter the medial woman we might not all embrace it you know a lot of people just turn their backs on that find it very uncomfortable don't want to go down that path and try to carry on as quote normal whatever normal is for them but I think that we all during menopause can embody some face of the medial woman it could be one of the three that I've mentioned it could be others when we come out of menopause and we're beginning to step into that new story that we have been waiting for that we've been incubating in that kind of dark crucible of menopause then we have a much more open field of archetypes and I think that the journey for each of us in the years following menopause will be fundamentally different will be very unique and the way that I think of that and that I write about it in Haggitude is that it's the time when we uncover our inner hag and I want to say a little bit before I carry on about the word hag because I know it's a word that not everybody loves um why do I think the word hag is important if you look it, it's a different word from the word crone okay and I'm looking at this purely not in not in the way that you all might perceive it I'm looking at this purely and simply in terms of story as it is crone generally in European myth and fairy tale refers to a very very old woman somebody who is right at the end of her elder years she can be frail she's not always frail but she can be frail she's quite wizened very very old hag on the other hand is a label that encompasses the whole of the second half of life now like all like many such words which for example the word hag has been hijacked by the patriarchy if I can just keep it that simple and it has come to mean a very ugly kind of warty old woman often quite nasty or positively evil in some situations who is the one character in the fairy tales that you do not want to meet back in the day she was exactly the character in the fairy tales that you wanted to meet because she was the one who knew what you needed to move out of the terrible situation that you had left behind you into a potential solution a hag in the old stories was a woman who did not fit within the system she was a woman who was outside of the system and because of that she was very frightening and therefore inevitably the patriarchy demonized her she was a woman who came riding out of the woods 
to tell the very fine knight Percival in the stories of the Grail quest what a terrible job he was doing, how he was way, way too full of himself sitting around with all his posh friends at King Arthur's court when he should be out there doing something very much more meaningful in the forest. She did not come from King Arthur's court, from the establishment. She came out of the forest to tell Percival that. We find old women like Babi Yaga who don't live in the community. They live in the heart of the forest. They have to be found. They're wild creatures. They're not tame. Um, and because of this, they are able to to really help the heroine and the hero transform the story and move beyond it. But because they're outside the system, they're perceived to threaten the system and therefore they must be demonized. So Hag is this woman who is older, who lives outside of the system, who is not therefore partaking of the cultural mythology, which tells us what a woman should be, and therefore having stepped outside of the cultural mythology, can actually comment on it, disrupt it when it needs to be disrupted, and tell people all of the ways in which it is not functioning at all, at all. So I like the word hag because it encompasses this power, it encompasses this, this kind of outsideness, which is necessary to really perceive what is wrong with the world and how it might potentially be fixed. Hag. So the inner hag to me is a fine thing to uncover. Uh, we're not looking at uncovering something warty and old and frail and um, crumbling. So I think of this finding our path through the second half of life as discovering our inner hag. And, you know, it reminds me, I guess, of um, a phrase that Michelangelo used. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact detail now. Um, he was, he said, he, he is, well, this is a line that's attributed to him, whether he actually said it or not. But he said when he, when he created sculpt sculptures, that he saw the angel in the marble and he carved until he set the angel free. And I think of that as what we are doing as we step out of menopause, that we're trying to set our inner angel free, except it's not our inner angel, it's our inner hag. So when each of us has chipped away during menopause at, at all of the marble, what is the shape of what's left? And it will be unique for each of us, but the stories can give us ideas as to what that might be. They're not exclusive, but they give us some sense. So let's just quickly go through some of those stories to look at what happens to us as we come out of menopause. I believe that that inner hag whose image every one of us carries within us really reflects our own unique variety of wisdom. And it reflects the unique gift that I believe, a belief which dates all the way back to Plato and, and beyond, the gift that each of us brings to this very difficult world at this time for a purpose. It reflects, if you like, our calling uh, by which I don't mean vocation, I mean our calling, which again represents the essence of who we are. What are we here to do? What are we here to show? What are we here to be? What have we got to give? And in looking for glimpses of our in hag, there's a lovely phrase that the, the poet, um, the British poet who now lives in um, the West Coast of America, David White, he calls it the truth at the center of the image you were born with. So this old ancient Greek philosophical idea that each of us is born into this world, comes into this world with a purpose to create something, to be something, to offer the world a gift. So the inner hag reflects all of that. Who, who it is that there's the essence of us, what our gift is, what we have to offer to the world and also to ourselves and our own soul growth. So we're looking for hints to give us an idea of what our inner hag is. 
Now, there are all kinds of ways of looking for hints. You can look at dreams, you can look at poems that you like, you can look at art that kind of leaps out at you that you don't really know why you love that painting so much, but it gives you a glimmer, perhaps, of something you might want to become. I focus because that's my love um, and, and what I understand better than anything else in the world. I focus on stories to give us a glimpse of the inner hag that we might become. Now, the archetypal older women in our stories are not like many of the younger characters, the you know princesses with the golden hair and, and all. They're not simple, straightforward characters very often. Usually there is a complexity about them. They rarely, for example, fit into a very neat goody versus bad, baddy kind of typology. They often appear in the guise of what we might call the dark feminine. Slightly mad, um, more than a little bad, definitely dangerous to know. It's not that they are evil. It's not that they are good. It's just that they are... Hmm, they are essentially themselves. They're kind of beyond morality. They know what needs to be done. And they try to persuade the heroes and heroines to do it. So you have often old women as kind of ambivalent characters. And Baba Yaga is a classical example of that, if you know the stories. So in, in the one of the most common stories about Baba Yaga, um, a young girl called Vasilisa, to cut a very long story short, goes to Baba Yaga's hut in the forest looking for fire. She wants fire to take home because the lights have gone out and it's dark and it's cold. And in order, before she gives her the fire, Baba Yaga tests her. And she tests her in a very deep way. This is not play. If she fails the test, she'll die because Baba Yaga has a man-sized oven in her hut and if the person that comes along fails the test, she'll be cooked and eaten. So everything is at stake in these tests. Now, that makes a lot of people think that Baba Yaga is a bad person because she might eat a child. But that's the wrong way to look at these characters. You know, when we're talking about the dark feminine, what they're doing is they're testing and they're testing to the point of death. There are consequences in all of these good old stories. So we tend to think of the dark feminine as, you know, the terrible mother, the death goddess, the spiteful fairy godmother or the evil hag, the kind of Hansel and Gretel witch who devours the children. But really, in most of the old stories, these characters are not incontrovertibly negative. They're simply there to test. They are forces of nature. And, you know, you're required to measure yourself against the forces of nature. So I think Really, these negative aspects of some of the old women we find in our fairy tales are very much a kind of encouragement by an overculture which specializes in demonizing the feminine and particularly demonizing the, the elder feminine. Um, we don't much give credence or space to the positive features of the dark feminine, which are faces of transformation, rebirth. You know, so death in order to be reborn, healing. The dark feminine is a very, very complex idea, and it's not wholly negative, whereas a lot of the recent versions of the stories have been simplified by a very patriarchal culture to make it so. So what I'm trying to say is that when we encounter these old women in the fairy stories, they're not always smiley and nice and kind of helpful. Sometimes they come across as very frightening, but in the best old tales, they never come across as evil. That would just be dull. That's not what, what they're for. So they kind of encompass the, the mysteries and magic of womanhood. They encompass the kind of um, the chaos of creation and destruction of birth and death and rebirth of uh, rage, of a very fierce compassion of eroticism and a kind of spiritual ecstasy and the culture often is very uncomfortable with these energies because they're disruptive energies they're not nice they're not invisible they're not polite they're not in their place but i think we really need to learn to look at these elder women characters in the old stories as representing energies that a culture needs in order to be healthy and to grow and to continue transforming itself so Briefly, the kind of 
archetypal old women that we find in the old stories. And these are the ones that I talk about specifically in Haggitude. Again, it's not, um, these are not the only archetypes probably that are out there, but they're the ones that, that I thought were the most important and I fit into the book. We have many, many examples of the creatrix, old women who literally weave the world into being. Think of the three fates in Greek mythology. In art, they were portrayed as beautiful young women. In the oldest texts, they were old women, because who else but an old woman would have the wisdom to weave the world into being? The fates did not just dole out, you know, destiny type stuff to individuals. The fates literally held the world in balance. If somebody took too much of a thing, or if somebody took what was forbidden to them, then in ancient Greek uh, cosmology, the whole world would fall out of balance. So in stepped the fates to put it right again. They knew what was needed to put a world that was out of balance back in balance. And all the while they were weaving and spinning and making it go round. Old women, not men, not young women, old women. So the creatrix is a really, really interesting character. How do we keep things moving, growing? How do we as older women sense the balance, see the bigger picture of the tapestry and understand what must be done to put things back into balance? Forces of nature, guardians and protectors of the land. And the Kalyuk, the old woman that I mentioned right at the beginning of this talk, was absolutely a guardian and protector of the land. So she not only shaped the land and was imminent in the land, but she would, for example, stand up against human hunters who would, for example, take pregnant deer in season while they were pregnant. And she would forbid them to take the pregnant deer. And if they didn't take the pregnant deer, she would allow them a, a stag a male deer at the correct time of year when it was appropriate, just enough, no more than need be, but just enough to keep them going. So that sense of the old woman in this strong position, representing the land, knowing when to say no, enough. Best example of that, the Kalia from the Gaelic traditions. Fairy godmothers, not twinkly, you know, wands and pretty dresses and all of that kind of thing, but the serious old fairy godmothers who were mentors of troubled children, who were mentors for children and young people who did not know how to find their path in the world and who showed them how to find their path in the world. We need mentors. And, you know, the fairy godmother wasn't necessarily just, as I say, just a light kind of twinkly old woman. Think of Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins was actually quite a serious kind of mentor because she didn't just, she wasn't just lighthearted playing kind of tricks and games and singing and um, floating off into the sky with umbrellas. She taught those children how to survive in quite difficult, challenging circumstances. So, there is a very, very serious role of the fairy godmother. And what I like about the fairy godmother is that for those of us who don't have children of our own and can't therefore be grandmothers, we can always be a fairy godmother. So the mentor is a really important um, archetype. Tricksters and truth tellers, disruptors of the culture, as I've mentioned before, the woman who comes riding out of the woods um, and tells um, the knights all of the ways in which they're mus mucking everything up and, and, and not doing their job. Trickster is a disruptive character. Trickster comes into a culture to shake it up when it really needs to be shaken up because it's either stagnated or because it's going down the wrong path. We see many tricksters and truth tellers in European mythology. And truth telling is a complex phenomenon. You know, it's not just about blurting out what you think. It's about weighing up when the right time is to speak what needs to be said, what the truth is, because there is never any one truth in any given situation. There are also always multiple truths, but that is another key archetype that we find in the old stories. The wise woman, the woman who has deep vision, who sees into the future, for example, the prophets. In um, ancient Greece, the, um, the oracle at Delphi, the Pythia, was not allowed to become the Pythia 
until she was over 50. There was a sense that there was a, a kind of purity of vision that older women had when they were out of the kind of clutter early years, if you like. So that sense of being able to see, not, not just straight divin divination, but just to predict what's going to happen through wisdom and through insight and through a particularly strong relationship with the mystical, with the other world. The dangerous old woman, Baba Yaga, the one who tests, the one who is the initiator of the younger women. So it's a little bit different from the fairy godmother, where the fairy godmother is actively trying to help. The dangerous old woman, it's not that she's not trying to help, but she's just pushing it a little bit further than the fairy godmother would. And then finally, um, the end of this journey through the second half of life is inevitably death. It, it is a journey which is intended to end in death. That's another conversation our culture is very bad at, but we don't have time to go there. But there are many, many archetypes of death or harbingers of death. The banshee in the Irish tradition who sees death coming and wails to forewarn of it. Um, there is a character in a story that I tell for the first time in um, Haggitude, uh, a kind of a, a Sami, Samoyed, Siberian story about an old woman who lives deep in the in the earth in a cave surrounded by effectively skeletons who sleeps on the bones of a dead hero in order to bring him back to life so she is the kind of mother of death and rebirth so we have all of these different archetypal characters and the question that i'd like to ask as you go into your breakout rooms, which hopefully Gina is going to organize for you any, any minute now, is I'd like you just to spend some time. So we have, I think, 15 minutes here, yeah, uh, guys. Uh, I'd like you just to spend 15 minutes talking about these different archetypal expressions of elderhood in women, talking about which ones you most resonate with, whether there are any particular iterations of the inner hag that you feel called to identify with. Baba Yaga's shape-shifting hut in the woods or um, the, the woman riding out of the woods to point out all of the ways in which the culture has gone wrong. Many of us will, most of us will find that we relate to more than just one archetypal old woman. But the chances are that one of them will perhaps most clearly reflect the essence of our individual calling at this time. So really, the, the intent of the, the conversation in the breakout rooms is, is very, very informal. Just have a chat about the ways in which these different types of old women might relate to you. Or if there are any that I haven't spoken about that you that you were thinking about, that would be lovely, too. We're all coming back. Where are we all? Yeah, I think we're all here by one. So we're pretty good. Sharon, are we ready for you to take some questions? Indeed, yes. Or insights? Um, let me look at the chat. Now, does anybody have anything they'd like to uh, ask Sharon from your um, discussion or what you took away from what she was talking about, which was absolutely fascinating wonderful it's what's what's so great Sharon was the positiveness the positivity the positive language you can use around those elder years when often we can fall into the trap of moaning about being an older woman and how we're seen it's uh, it's changed around for a really important conversation about how how can we use these years and who could we be where do we get our examples I think it was uh Brilliant, enjoyed sharing the space. Does anybody want to share some insight that came from their Zoom, from their breakout room that you shared there, you want to share with us? I'll Which share. One you to go with? Yes, yes, go for it. Um, it was, you know, 10, 12 minutes. And as soon as we got into the room, it was like, talk, 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 oh. talk. Everybody wanted to talk. And it was marvelous to actually just be in a space where there was um, no rubbish, no bullshit, just talk quickly about what is real for us right now. We could have talked for hours. <laughs> so it was great. Thank you. Good. Uh, 
sorry, I was putting the spotlight on you. Oh, no, no spotlight. Okay. Uh, I'll go to gallery view. Anybody else want to put their hand up and share? Okay, yeah. Okay, Violet, go ahead. <laughs> Isn't it amazing though? If you wave your hand, you know, it kind of it puts up the wee flag. Um, anyway, what I wanted to share was um, I, I just love the fact that we are celebrating women who are older and have created this, um, I, I, you know, by, by the stories, by recognising and celebrating them. It's almost like, you know, there's a now a group of women who are stepping into their power in this kind of older age and it gives a format to it because it, it's something I've been quite passionate about for quite some time that, that you know, that, that, that older women have, you know, um, kind of previously kind of been disregarded and, and you know, this, this talk and this discussion has been all about celebrating and recognising their power and potential um, to, to live exciting magical lives so yeah i'd just like to thank sharon for that i think that was great thank you yeah i think that's exactly the kind of conversation we need to be having in a world of doom and gloom where older women are so often and so easily written off as uh, as irrelevant or invisible i'm just going to bring up eileen eileen uh, i'm going to spotlight you but you haven't got your yeah I've, I've logged okay. in twice it Go doesn't ahead, matter but, yeah. um, uh, thank you so much Sharon thank you so so much I mean like as, as my my fellow females have said you know you could sit here and just talk for hours about it but um, as someone who from a very young age has always um, has always um, loved the older vintage I mean I'd be the kid at the school bus stop that'd be elbowing out of the way the rude uh you know 11 12 year olds who are pushing out in front you know pushing in front of the pensioners trying to get onto the who made the mistake of trying to go home when the school gates open to now um I'm starting the menopause process myself how fortunate I feel that a friend of mine sent me this link and that I um I get to reframe and craft a completely different uh, opinion of not lack but abundance as you know step into this second stage I really like the storytelling aspect I loved repositioning the, the menopause it doesn't happen by mistake it is a burning and a giving of birth of myself and and, and I've got to the, the the planets have aligned that means that I am actually sat in my mother's home um, listening to this and I've got to, I've got to give thanks to my original hag and wonderful mother who has you know trailblazed in her own way um, and has, has shown me also that you know you don't go quietly into the night just because you know you start the menopause or you you turn 40 50 60 70 80 you know it's it's just it's it's wonderful. I'm so glad I've been here and part of this elderhood discussion for women. It's brilliant. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you so much. I'm glad it was inspiring. How lovely. Bless you, Eileen. We've got a question. Pat, do you have a question in the? Yeah. Uh, go for it, Pat. You've got a question yeah, through the chat. Yeah, in, yeah, in, in our, our just. Oh, in, in our oh, room. Another pat. <laughs> oh, hang on. We've got two pats speaking. We've got two pats. Yeah. I've got Pat Hughes speaking. Okay, now. thank you. Yeah. Uh, in our group, we were just coming to a discussion about our place in society and how we find or make our place in a society in which we're not valued. And what we can, you know, what, what are the sort of levers that we can use in order to be heard? That, that was where our discussion was heading, but uh, we ran out of time. Yeah, ten minutes isn't very long, is it? I, I have to say, if if it's it's okay with with you guys, we we are about to start um, in just over a week's time a year long program um, around exactly that discussion, um, centered around some of the issues I'm talking about in Haggitude, um, which really is trying to bring together a group of elder women to ask exactly those questions. You know, what resources do we need? um both for ourselves and also to put out into the world so some of the stories for example that i've just been very br briefly alluding to here some of which are covered in haggitude but there are so many other stories of, of older women that i didn't find time for how do we collect those together how do we disseminate 
those, how do we seed them out into the world so that we get people telling these stories to each other of older women? Because that's where things begin to change. You know, if you, you change the narrative by offering narratives that replace the one that is dysfunctional. So anyway, if any of you are interested in that, um, there's a website, haggitude.org. Uh, which is offering resources where you can get, you know, the stories um, for free and um, a podcast and um, and the membership program if you're interested. That's exactly the kind of thing that I think we need to gather together a bunch of women to look at creating. Fantastic. And we can send uh, the connection out for that in, in, a, in uh, the email that we send out afterwards as well. We can send oh, it with, although Judy's put the link in the chat as well. Uh, there's a second Pat who, who spoke. Oh, Pat. oh yes. <laughs> yeah, <that's all. laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. I enjoyed it very much. But what interests me, I've always been interested in the, the idea of metaphor and your stories that you're referring to, of course, are metaphor in my terms, they're metaphors. And how how in, in your view do you and can we enable ourselves and the people to, to work with metaphor? I, you know, I think I really do think it's innate. Um, I think we really are storytelling animals. And if you look at, you know, back in the day after I did my psychology training, um, I went into neuroscience and I was a neuroscientist for a long time. And there is a lot of evidence from from neuroscience that shows us the ways in which we we respond to stories and the ways in which when we are sitting listening to someone else tell a story or even when we're hearing a story read to us um, our brains kind of um, they kind of go into sync with the other people who are hearing the same story so in a very very real neuroscientific sense stories kind of align us you know they bring us together and there is this there is an innate human ability, I think, to see metaphors and to see symbols and images and motifs in these stories in a very, very similar way. We understand them. It is, a, it is, it is in us. Uh, it's not something that that we have to learn. And I think for a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, we're told that it's okay to do that when we're kids, to learn from story. That's what kids are supposed to do. But then, like so many things you know we're supposed to grow out of it and into a whole different way of looking at the world which is very much more scientific or often scientistic and it seems to me that the imagination has become very much under underrated in modern culture and there are signs that it's beginning to be different you know we're beginning to see a little bit of a resurgence of myth um from the stephen fry's and the neil gaiman's all the way through to you know many 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 uh, retellings in the fiction world of, of greek mythology so i think there is an understanding that story has wisdom it's not just escapism it has wisdom and it can help us to imagine a better world so i think you're absolutely right it's really really important and to me the key is to keep telling the stories to get the stories out there and to show to tell them to each other, to tell them in groups, to tell them to our family, to our kids, to our uh, daughters, and and to to help people to understand why they matter. Thank you. Lovely. A A April, you've got a question for us, or for Sharon, or a spotlight. Super fast comment. I wanted to say, Sharon, one I love the mythology and stories. I really enjoy not only learning myself better through understanding archetypes. I use story with children and I feel really inspired at just the easy um, weaving of really enhancing intergenerational awareness, conversation, connection through already I have all these stories, but to really hone in on stories and embrace this part of life I'm moving into and my connection with um, youth. I'm excited about bringing this in a little bit more to that intergenerational dialogue of story yeah. for me. Thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I think I think that the best fairy tales do do really um, help us to see that the the importance of a multi generational perspective on the world. You know, because the old women are as important as the children who are going off on the journeys. They also, the best old fairy tales, particularly in this part of the world, help us to understand the beyond uh, human, you know, the other than humans. The animal wisdom, particularly in stories from Britain and Ireland, is, is profound. Whenever anybody needs the answer to a question, 
If the humans in the village don't know it, what do they do? They tell you to go to the animals and the animals know, the oldest animals always know the answer. So there is that in, in all of these old stories, it's often not appreciated. You know, they are, they are incredibly egalitarian. They respect everybody's individual knowledge, whether that everybody is a tree or a crow or an old woman or a young princess. And that's the beauty of them and why I think they really are incredibly powerful vehicles for transformation and for education. Brilliant. Well, before I hand over to Judy, as we come to the end, I just want to ask you, Sharon, what you think, um, just to put me, uh, what you think this last week when we saw the passing of uh, Queen Elizabeth, what effect that might have had? Because for 70 years, she's been the wise woman and supposedly four billion people watch this, this this grand exit, this honouring of new, you know, 10, 12 days of national mourning and all of the stories that were shared about her. What do you think that has done for this role of the elder wise woman passing on now to a male, a king, and the, the lines are now three males? But what do you think that might have added to the story of the wise woman? Gosh, that's a, that, uh, that requires a long answer that we don't have time for. I, I'm kind of interested myself, and I haven't quite got to the, the bottom of it yet. I'm still thinking it through, what, what archetype she represented, because it's not an obvious one. You know, the queen archetype is very much a, an archetype of kind of mother, mother years. Um, but I think what, we, what, we, what the world saw with her, and it saw a, a different kind of power as a young woman, is, is this ability of an elder woman to walk an incredibly difficult path, you know, in a world that is just so fraught with, with impossibilities. And nevertheless, in spite of everything, to be that, to be that symbol of strength, of strength and duty and endurance. And that is a really valuable, whatever you think of the monarchy, and I do not believe that the Queen was perfect. I think she had many flaws, but but that whole idea of duty and endurance and service, mm. you know, she represented throughout her life. And I think when she was an older woman, the fact that she would not give up even into her 90s, that she had that sense of, no, this is my calling. So to me, she was mm. kind of calling personified. And I think the fact that an older woman gave that to the world as a you know, as a, as she was that exemplar to the world, is a very very fine thing and 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 worthy of much more reflection than you know, I've been able to to give to it. So far. She, well, she definitely inspired me. Yeah. Um, so I know that you know we've had the Queen all this time, but because she passed, and we had the opportunity to look at her life um every day and uh wow service it's amazing what she gave to the world so yes it's an interesting it is it, uh, definitely worth further explanation so um we've had a wonderful evening tonight Sharon I'm going to hand over to Judy now because I know she would like to uh thank you and, and say goodbye she doesn't tell us what, uh, about other events so Judy um are you unmuted I am thank you um massive massive um thank you from me and here is Haggitude, Sharon's new book. It can be ordered from your local bookshop. You can download it and hear Sharon reading it, or you can order it online. And I'm convinced it's going to be a classic. Mm. My pleasure, and it is particularly Sharon's beautiful writing. And as I read each line, I think, oh, this is such beautiful prose. So um, I'm enjoying Sharon's language as well as all the stories and the messages and the wisdom that's coming through on every page. So I, ha I heartily recommend it. And I thank you so much, Sharon, for so gently giving us the most wonderful experience tonight. It's been such a pleasure. <laughs>